everyone. Let's get started with a question. Try calculating this expression. Oh, this question is. Mitten, hello there. Good day. Let me answer. This is a logarithmic calculation. We just need to think about what power of 2 equals 8. Well, 8 can be written as 2 cubed. So the answer is 3. You solved it so easily. I need to come up with another one. Whoa, this, this is... This is troubling. If we don't solve this problem, the world will come to an end. What, really? That's terrible. Don't worry, I'm here. So this problem is... What is log of negative 1? It seems simple, but I just can't think of the answer. When the base is omitted like this, it depends on the context. In this case, it seems to mean the natural logarithm. Normally, the number inside a logarithm is positive. But in this problem, a negative value is given. We might need to review the definition of log. Leave it to me. Let's assume that a is a positive number other than 1. When a raised to the power of y equals x. This y is called the logarithm of x to base a, and we write it as y equals log base a of x. You remembered it well. In particular, logarithms with base g known as Napier's constant are called natural logarithms. There are several common notations for natural logarithms. In this case, when the base is omitted, it represents the natural logarithm. Which means, when e raised to the power of y equals negative 1, that y would be the log of negative 1 in the problem, right? But since e is a positive number, raising it to any power seems to result in a positive value. This feels contradictory somehow. What could this possibly mean? That's true if we're thinking within the realm of real numbers. What if we consider it in the realm of complex numbers? Complex numbers? Oh, that's right. There was a formula for e raised to an imaginary power like this. It's a famous theorem called Euler's formula. When you calculate e to the i theta, the real part is cosine of theta, and the imaginary part is sine of theta. When you think about this on the complex plane, e to the i theta corresponds to a point on the unit circle. And the argument or the angle with the positive real axis is theta. Now let's consider a half rotation. The argument is represented by pi, and it reaches this point on the circle, which is negative 1. You can express it as e to the i pi equals negative 1. This is also famous as Wheeler's identity. Well then, e raised to the power of y equals negative 1. We've been looking for such a y, and e to the i pi equals negative 1. This is exactly what we were searching for. In other words, log of negative 1 equals i pi. What do you think? Calculating the logarithm of a negative number gave us an imaginary number. This is fascinating. But something feels off. How? Oh, what's wrong? The equality e to the i pi equals negative 1 represents a half rotation on the complex plane. If we add one more rotation to this, what happens after 1.5 rotations? Um, after a half rotation by pi, we just add one more full rotation by 2 pi, so we should calculate e to the 3 i pi. This means it's the cube of e to the i pi. And since e to the i pi equals negative 1, huh? this result is also negative 1. That's correct. It means we made one additional rotation and returned to the same spot. In general, this equality holds for any integer n. Gear 1 plus 2n is an odd number, indicating a half rotation plus n full rotations. If n is negative, the rotation is in the opposite direction, but either way, the answer is still negative 1. So, since e raised to some power equals negative 1, that exponent must be log of negative 1. But n can be any integer, which means the answer has infinite possibilities. Ah, you're right! Um, what's happening here? Which one is the correct answer? What a mysterious phenomenon. However, this alone doesn't provide enough clues. For now, we're only considering the logarithm of negative 1, but maybe we can understand more by expanding the scope. When we talk about logarithms, we usually think of real number logarithms, but let's extend this to define logarithms for complex numbers. Here, let w and z be complex numbers. When e raised to the power of w equals z, the w is called the natural logarithm of z. Formally, this is the same as with real numbers, but its meaning remains shrouded in mystery. For now, let's aim to express w in terms of z, that way we can express log z in terms of z, and use that as the definition of the logarithm for complex numbers. Alright, let's express w in terms of z. 
So then... Um, what do we do? It's hard to do all at once. First let's examine what e to the w represents. We can represent w using two real numbers u and v. Then e to the w can be written as follows. Using the laws of exponents here, we can split the exponential into two parts. What does this mean? Well, let's focus on e to the bi first. This takes the same form as Euler's formula, which means it's on the unit circle in a complex plane, and its argument is v. Now if we multiply this by e to the u, we get e to the w. Since e to the u is a real number, it's like scaling a vector by a real number. The direction remains the same, but the length is scaled by e to the u. What a neat result! By the way, since e to the u is not zero here, we can see that e to the w is also not zero. Now that you mention it, that's true. Okay, let's organize the situation a bit. We are trying to define the logarithmic function for complex numbers. When e to the w equals z, if we can express w in terms of z, we can think of that as the definition of log of z. And then, when we represented w using u and v, we found that e to the w was located at this position on the complex plane. Now setting e to the w equals z, let's express w in terms of z. So, first, the real part u can be rewritten like this. Indeed, that's consistent with the definition of the natural logarithm. Now looking at the diagram, we see that e to the u equals the absolute value of z. Thus, it can be written like this. Since the absolute value of z is a positive real number, note that this is the real number logarithm we already know. And v is the argument of z, which is the angle with the positive real axis. Let's denote this as argument of z. Here we'll define the range of argument of z as negative pi to pi. This way, the argument is uniquely determined within one full rotation. If we allow any number of rotations, the argument wouldn't be uniquely defined. Huh! Is it okay to define it like that? Originally, there were no restrictions on the range of v, so why not allow any number of rotations? Well, that's one way to think about it, but in that case the value of log wouldn't be uniquely determined, and it would become a so-called multi-valued function. Here, we're defining it this way to avoid such a situation. I wonder if that's really okay. Something feels unsatisfying. To summarize the result, when e to the w equals z, w can be expressed in terms of z like this. However, note that e to the w cannot be zero. Thus, for any non-zero complex number z, let's define this log of z as the logarithmic function for complex numbers. Here, we're taking the representative value for the argument, so this is also called the principal value of the complex logarithm. That's why the Allen log is capitalized to emphasize it. It's as if you've known everything from the start. Let's take a look at important examples. When x is a positive real number, what is the value of log of x? Um, applying the definition. First, since x is positive, its absolute value is also x. Next, the argument is, since x is on the positive real axis, the angle it forms with the positive real axis is zero. So the result is log of x. Regarding positive real numbers, the complex logarithms match those for real numbers. This means that this definition can be considered an extension of the real number logarithm. Next, when theta is between negative pi and pi, what is the logarithm of e to the i theta? That sounds a bit tricky. First, according to Euler's formula, e to the i theta lies on the unit circle, so its absolute value is 1. Next, the argument is theta. Since log of 1 is 0, the answer is i theta. The logarithm of e to the i theta is i theta. That's a straightforward result. Hmm, but... What's wrong? This definition feels kind of weird to me. Why? We define the range of the argument as negative pi to pi. And here negative pi isn't included in the range, but pi is included. So if we calculate log of negative 1, since negative 1 is e to the i pi, Based on our earlier result, the answer is i pi. Oh yes, that's correct. Is there a problem with that? Well, calm down. Let's slightly change the range of the argument here to include negative pi and exclude pi. If we calculate log of negative 1 again, this time we need to consider negative 1 as e to the negative i pi. 
because negative pi is now within the range. And the answer becomes negative i pi. This, this is... Just by slightly changing the range of the argument, the value of the logarithm of negative 1 has drastically changed. This is unacceptable. And also, there's more? Let's assume we agree to fix the range of the argument. When we consider negative 1 as a complex number, its argument is pi. And the answer for log of negative 1 was i pi. Well, that's 2. Now, let z prime be a complex number slightly below negative 1 on the complex plane. The argument of z prime is almost negative pi. In fact, it's slightly greater than negative pi. So, it's within the defined range of the argument. Now, skipping the detailed calculation for a moment, the value of log of z prime is almost negative i pi. That's because the argument of z prime is nearly negative pi. Even though negative 1 and z prime are close on the complex plane, their logarithms differ significantly. To go further, on the negative real axis, log is a discontinuous function. This is quite a troublesome property. Sundaman is unusually sharp today. It can't be helped. I'll use my trump card. Ah, huh? a trump card? What is it this time? Sundaman, take, take a look, look at, at this. this. This, this is... What on earth is this spiral staircase? Hmm, I wonder where it leads to? Anyway, this resolves everything. Um, what do you mean? Let me explain. We will revisit the complex plane. However, let's exclude the origin. Then place a cut along the negative real axis. To be precise, we'll consider the boundary as part of the upper side. Next, prepare a second complex plane, make the same cut, and connect the cuts of the first and second planes. In other words, when you move P like this on the first plane, it appears on the second plane. And when you move Q like this on the second plane, it appears on the third plane. This continues infinitely in both directions. Well, what? The resulting surface is called the Riemann surface for the logarithmic function. This diagram is merely a conceptual representation, so in reality, each layer extends infinitely in the horizontal direction. Roughly speaking, a Riemann surface has a structure locally similar to the complex plane, and each function may correspond to a different Riemann surface. By using the Riemann surface, instead of the complex plane, as the domain of the logarithmic function, we can extend the logarithmic function continuously, in a natural way. This is because there is no need to limit the range of the argument to a single rotation. When you complete one rotation, you can seamlessly transition to the next layer. So, while this is an abuse of notation, on the complex plane, both e to the i pi and e to the negative i pi equal negative 1, and thus, we couldn't distinguish between these expressions. However, on the Riemann surface, we can distinguish between these two, and it allows us to calculate the logarithm naturally. Intuitively, this kind of logic holds true. This is amazing! I never imagined something like this was happening behind the logarithmic function. The world of complex functions is truly fascinating. Well then, take care everyone. See you again.